Uh, good afternoon, Shakespeare students. Um, I'm sitting out again trying to enjoy this uh, beautiful day. I'm on my deck and looking out over all of the serenity. It sort of reminds me a little bit of what we read in As You Like It. You remember when we talked about <clears throat> the pastoral tradition. Uh, as I sit here, I have forgotten what we're facing uh, in terms of what's going on in the world today. It's sort of a good respite from all of those cares and uncertainties. And uh, certainly, I'm very hopeful that all of you are doing well. And we are beginning to near the end of the semester. And what I want to do today is uh, give you a little bit of information about as you, I mean, excuse me, about Twelfth Night. And I'm not going to take the time to analyze it uh, as I did with um, The Merchant of Venice. So by now, all of you, uh, you've taken, uh, with the exception of one, and uh, your exam of The Merchant of Venice, you've been notified of your grades. And we're going to be drawing a close, in a sense, to the semester. Um, all of you know what today is. This is Shakespeare's birthday. So as a kind of tribute to Shakespeare, at the end of my uh, discussion or lecture, I'm going to give you a few questions that I want you to answer, and this will be a good little bonus grade to add, as well as I'm going to give you a few questions that I want you to answer over the play. And I will help, uh, tell you ahead of time, don't set this up in some formal uh, Word document as you did your exam. You can simply answer the questions and mail both sets in to me. And since it's Thursday, I think you should get these to me. They're not going to take you that long. I would think sometimes, maybe by 10 o'clock on Monday morning, this coming uh, Monday, uh, turn in these two sets of questions, which I will dictate once I finish <coughs> my uh, presentation. And then I'll likely deliver one more lecture and then talk to you about uh, the final, our preparation for the final exam, which will come then week after next. We're going to draw some uh, conclusions. So I still encourage you, uh, just keep on respecting my deadlines and turning in your work on time. All right, let me begin with you. And this will be a kind of insight, if you will, into Twelfth Night, or another title sometimes given to the play. Remember, some of these do have these double titles. This play is appropriately titled Twelfth Night or What You Will. Now, you remember as we studied comedy, in comedy, uh, his comedies always suggest an event, uh, a time, a place, that sort of thing. Whereas, you remember, as we discussed in terms of his tragedies, Particularly as we looked at his four great tragedies, uh, you have that insight into a particular person. Uh, in other words, you're going to delineate, you're going to have insight into a, a particular character. And for all purposes, that character becomes your uh, tragic protagonist. Sight, for example, King Lear, Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello. So here we're concerned with a particular time event. And all of you, I think, uh, can recall what Twelfth Night means. Uh, you know the time reference and that sort of thing. So I begin my discussion by giving you a little bit of background. And uh, some critics have dubbed this play, Twelfth Night, as Shakespeare's farewell to comedy. Um, for all purposes, this play stands at the summit uh, of Shakespeare's career as a writer of happy comedies. Um, you all know from uh, when I had introduced you to As You Like It, and then you remember our discussion of The Merchant of Venice, uh, you have become familiar with Shakespeare's perception of what constitutes comedy. Uh, this is a third play uh, simply following uh, his theory of comedy. And after Twelfth Night, uh, Shakespeare is going to abandon what is called this purely 
festive comedy. Uh, what he's going to now begin doing, and we, because of the events of this semester, I did not have time to teach one because it would have been a little too troubling, it would have been uh, too much on you in a kind of hurried fashion to read the next play. But to let you know what would have occurred after this play, Shakespeare begins writing, you remember what I had told you uh, when I gave you background at the beginning of the semester, he begins writing what's called his dark comedies. And also this is a carryover from what we said in terms of the Merchant of Venice, his problem plays. And the one I would like to cite for you as a kind of dark comedy, of course, is I would have taught measure for measure. So uh, I think by now you will have a good insight into what Shakespeare wanted to uh, achieve in his uh, comedies, his so-called uh, intent here. Now, as I've done in the past, I always like to explain to you a little bit about the structure of the plot uh, threads and that sort of thing. In terms of Twelfth Night, <clears throat> the structure may be analyzed in terms of uh, probably three plot themes or threads. And once again, he has done, I think, a very, very skillful job of blending uh, his plot lines. I began by calling your attention to probably what some would consider to be the most important, and that's the romantic plot. And here you have three characters of importance, Arsenio, Arsenio Olivia, and Viola. And what it amounts to here in terms of the romantic plot line, it's a story that deals with all of the complications uh, arising out of the Duke's fixation uh, on Olivia. And then maybe to complement uh, or to complicate it a little bit more, you have to pay attention to Viola's disguise. See, she's going to be in the middle of these two characters and their pursuits. So I consider, and once again, by, by calling your attention to the idea of this romantic plot thread theme, whatever words you wish to use, Shakespeare is still following uh, the requirements of what would constitute romantic comedy. Now, another plot line in the play is the low, what I call the low comic plot. And here, <laughs> this plot uh, line involves three characters, Maria, Malvolio, uh, well, actually, I can even, think, uh, as I'm saying this, I can think of a fourth, Sir Toby and Sir Andrew. And some say, well, how are, the, how are these two, meaning the romantic plot and the low comic plot, uh, connected? They're connected by the practical jokes. Uh, they, these jokes, particularly the jokes that are played upon Malvolio, uh, draw the two, uh, these two plots together. And I find that there's a third one, and this is probably a carryover from The Merchant of Venice. There is what I'm going to call the Renaissance love plot. And that's the uh, plot, that plot line talks about the relationship between Sebastian and Antonio. You remember, uh, that is this idea of what constitutes a kind of ideal platonic love between two people. And I think that's very important in terms of the play, and it ties in perfectly well in creating, I think, a very coherent, unified, uh, uh, well-presented play. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, some say, well, what's going to keep comedy uh, from being painful? Well, it's along what I'm explaining to you now. Chiefly the idea of what's called plotting and tone. Uh, in Shakespeare's comedy, the plot and the tone are very finely controlled. Uh, so, <clears throat> for our benefit, we have, we have the, I think it's almost a kind of luxury, 
we never have to anticipate what I would say is a kind of serious outcome. We know all you have to do is be patient. We know everything will turn out as well as it can in the end. No matter how foolishly some of these characters behave. Now, this idea of their being foolish is not falling away from some, shall I say, implicit social code. Uh, it simply involves the inherent foolishness of what defines, please, human nature. Now, some misread a bit and say what Shakespeare is doing in terms of the foolishness displayed by several characters in the play, that uh, he's being satirical. Uh, he actually is not. He's not real uh, ridiculing. Uh, this is a kind of acceptance in terms of the human condition because, look, you know very well, for all purposes, human nature at times does behave. Human beings will behave in a kind of foolish way. This is acceptance. Now, I don't want to mislead you. Shakespeare very much could write satiric comedy, but he felt that in this play, satiric or the satiric thrust was not in play. So I wanted to make this uh, assertion to you to let you know that what you're going to do is probably a little bit more so in this play than uh, The Merchant of Venice, and I think probably a little more so than even in As You Like It. All you want to do is sit back and enjoy the antics displayed by these characters. Now, another little bit of background I want to give you in terms of Twelfth Night. Um, you remember that Shakespeare's plays were written to be performed to audiences from different social classes and uh, backgrounds. In other words, you have people who will attend these plays of varying uh, intellects. Uh, for example, you're going to have characters, uh, and the, uh, they attended these plays, who I simply say are very down-to-earth characters. In other words, uh, these are the characters who represent the so-called working classes. But they're present side by side with um, classes that we would say uh, are somewhat uh, aristocratic. And the idea here on the part of Shakespeare, Shakespeare is very careful to appeal to the uh, artistic appetites of not only an aristocratic audience, but to the groundlings as well. And here his plays become you remember a kind of symbol of culture and education. All right, so I think he's done a very good job because he's very skilled. He's very able to manipulate form, structure, and language, in a sense, to contribute to what he wants to do in terms of achieving the meaning of uh, his plays. I think you will find that this is most true, if you will, in terms of um, Twelfth Night. Now, through the form of dialogue, uh, Shakespeare is going to, I think, in a most careful way, I think, I'll use my word again, artistic way, he's going to convey the relationship between characters. Uh, look what Shakespeare is going to do in terms of um, uh, your, the character, Festy. Uh, he's going to give him this most notable aphorism, better a witty fool than a foolish wit. Isn't that great? So what you find here in terms of what uh, our fool says, he's erudite and he can present the audience with the higher knowledge of the plot. Now I always like to see him, uh, uh, Festy, as a kind of, of a, he, he's a roving uh, entertainer. And he has the distinct advantage in this play of not having to take sides. Now, of course, he's a participant in the play, 
but very important. He is an acute observer, if you will, of human nature. Remember, touchstone uh, in as you like it. Now, uh, the form of language also uh, adds actors. In other words, actors are going to have the task of adding a kind of insight and depth to the characters they're going to portray. And one of the ways that you're going to identify with how these actors will present themselves on stage, pay attention to some extent to their names because their names will provide a kind of insight and meaning uh, to each character. And in turn, the actor who portrays this character. In other words, it's going to be very important for that actor to convey what is going to be called for uh, in terms of what I would say the essence of that characters. In other words, to put it rather, I suppose, clearly and bluntly for you, the names of these characters stand for something. And you will understand what their names mean by the actor's ability to portray that character accordingly. So, for an example, let's take Malvolio. All right. If the name Malvolio, the suggestion is that it calls up such responses as bad desires or bad intentions. And I think that Malvolio in our play is a suit subject for good intentions and bad desires. Another insight, another character, look at Sir Toby Belch. What a great name. He's a bag of hot air. Uh, he gives way to gluttony. Uh, uh, and then, you remember in the play, if you were going to see uh, a presentation of the play, uh, constantly he's going to give way to, which was actually pretty well accepted at that time. Uh, some today would say it would be a kind of uh, rude behavior. But he gives way to burping. Uh, and again, look what that name suggests. So see, when I say that the actor the actor has got to be willing to convey these physical uh, gestures. How about Sir Andrew? Uh, Sir Andrew is a fool, but remember, he's not, the, he's not going to be an allowed fool. He's a natural fool. And part of his name, you remember whenever he speaks, he has difficulty. He's very unsure of himself. He's very nervous. And remember, his cheek trembles. And then, festy, jolly. There's a kind of festive, he has this festive personality. He's quick-witted. Uh, notice, for example, when he gets into difficulty uh, with Olivia, and Olivia is almost to the point of wanting to dismiss him, what he's able to do how he manipulates her, if you will, into changing her mind. And then another would be, of course, Viola. And uh, Viola, Shakespeare, I think, was most skilled in thinking of her name. Uh, her disguise uh, is the name, uh, her disguise as a man is the name of a musical instrument with a deeper tone than a violin. Now look, the actor who's going to portray Viola has to make sure that he, she on the stage, <coughs> excuse me, will be able to portray, excuse me, to portray this masculine tone. So I think Shakespeare does a superb job here. See, this is going, all, all of what I've just talked to you about will add a kind of depth perception to the play. A good understanding, but really a good opportunity to be enjoyed and entertained. Now, I would like to call your attention to what is called, I think very important, 
and you must remember this as you draw conclusions in terms of your reading and in preparation for the final. The structure of a Shakespeare play, again, contributes to its meaning. So the structural, I talked to you a moment ago about the structural uh, plot lines of the play. Now I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about the structural pattern of the play. Uh, there are three main sections here, and one section I call your attention to uh, is this idea of exposition in terms of the play. Uh, and when I speak of exposition, uh, you're going to be given all of the information, all of the background information that you need to know. Now, that's important because without this background information, uh, you won't understand how the conflict is going to emerge. And remember I told you in comedy, you have the opportunity to show a superiority that you might not be able to show in tragedy. This is going to be one of the reasons why you're going to be a little bit more comfortable in viewing a comedy. Remember, and here the answer is the ability on the part of Shakespeare to execute, to employ dramatic irony. Now, if I say the structural theme of the play, I'm going to tell you exactly where you can find it. It's in Act 2, Scene 3, about line 40. The structural theme of the play is the idea of corpe diem. In other words, you all are familiar with the term, seize the day. All right, now, the problem then is, in terms of our play, uh, you have to pay attention, if you will, to this theme of excess in the play. And you have two characters who, go in, who will behave in a kind of excessive way. Uh, go ahead and look at Olivia, if you will. Uh, notice that she's excessive in her grief resulting from the loss of her brother. You remember how she delays ever getting involved with the suitor? The idea is that her grief is prolonged. And look at the Duke, for example, Arsenio. Uh, what you find here is a kind of overdone romantic sentimentality. It's almost to the point of being maudlin at times. Now, what I want to get across to you in terms of the structural pattern is these two characters are excessive in their behavior because they engage in what I'm going to call, if you will, overindulgence. Uh, probably a, a particular word I would want you to see is the word S-U-R-F-E-I-T, surfeit. They overdo uh, their dramatization of what they consider and it becomes a kind of fault, don't you see? Uh, all right, the Duke is hopelessly in love, for example. And all of this is very much uh, exaggerated. Another aspect of, the pat of this pattern is you're going to have to have development in the play. So in this regard, because of the way that they behave, the way that they act, it's going to be, uh, build up a kind of dramatic tension and what will happen here is it will move the conflict to its climax and then to conclude uh, this idea uh, of the uh, shall I say the three main sections of the play you've got to have resolution and so I repeat you have exposition you have development and you have resolution and here, in terms of revolution, uh, resolution, you're going to have to establish some kind of equilibrium in terms of characters. In other words, uh, at a given time, disguises have to come off. And the idea is all of these plot threads, in a sense, have to be realized. Now, um, so once again, I think... Uh, if you will, for all purposes, there really is a kind of, uh, gosh, 
order, uh, a kind of unity that you're going to find, if you will, in any of your comedies. Now, I'm going to make this meeting a little bit short, and uh, what I want to do is call your attention. I'm going to give you a kind of assignment, if you will, and the assignment, what I want you to do here in terms of your assignment, I told you, first of all, that I'm going to give you, uh, as a little bonus assignment, uh, some questions that I want you particularly to answer in terms of uh, Shakespeare. So let me do that first. Let me get my sheet. And you likely would know this. My gosh, this is a good little bonus assignment for you. So what I want you to do is to answer these six questions on Shakespeare. And as I said, you don't have to go in. I mean, they're uh, pretty obvious, uh, pretty objective. And all I'm trying to do is I'm recognizing Shakespeare's birthday. We're in celebration of, of him as this playwright. So here, let me dictate these questions to you, and you just give me an answer. Uh, number one, how old would Shakespeare be today? Now, you have to take into account into account when he was born and then know where we are today. April the 23rd, 2020. How would he be today? All right. So if you're good at all at math, I think you can probably uh, use your computer or calculator or whatever. Number two, what was his religion? Think about that. Think about when I had given you the background in the beginning. Um, number three, where is Shakespeare buried? You remember I told you about that, uh, how some critics are a bit misinformed. All right. Number four, what university did he attend? Think about what I've just asked you. Uh, number five, where was Shakespeare born? And then the last question is, who is his wife? All right. Now, give me just simply take the question, give me the answer. All right, I'm going to count this as a little a bonus assignment. So, again, this is going to help you to boost up your grade a bit. Now, the next thing I want to call your attention to is I'm going to give you, I think I've written out about six questions over the play. And I want you to answer these questions based upon your reading of the play. And uh, once again, this would be like a reading quiz. This is by no means a major exam. So go in and give me an answer to these uh, questions. Now what you're going to do, make these two separate. You're going to answer the uh, first questions on Shakespeare uh, separately and then give me another sheet. Or you can, if, it's, if you're still, uh, just skip down a little bit. And if you're still on the same page, give me an answer to these questions over the play. But I'm going to give you a grade over each set of questions, okay? A good way to, as I want to do before the end of the semester, a good way to build up your daily grades, all right? Uh, my first question is, how do, uh, how, uh, let me rephrase that. Show how the Duke and Olivia are excessive in their behavior. As you begin the play, show me how the Duke and Olivia are excessive in their behavior. You might want to go in a little bit and tell me how, how they are, but perhaps why they are, that sort of thing. And listen, I have no particular objection if you want to use a line reference from the play. That's going to simply add a little bit more to the quality of your answer, and I can put down even a better grade. Um, number two, what is the nature of this excess? This excess? Explain. What is the nature of this excess? Now, if you want to take that question and tie it in with number one, you may do so. So, what I'm asking for here is the two characters, how are both excessive in their behavior? Explain that. 
The next question is, why do, <clears throat> excuse me, why does Viola conspire with the captain that she present, be presented to uh, the Duke as a eunuch? Do you remember uh, in terms of the shipwreck and what happens and that sort of thing? So the question is, why does Viola conspire with the captain that she be presented to the Duke as a eunuch? All right. The next question, why does Olivia wish to give Viola a ring? Who is to give that ring to uh, Viola? Now you remember what happens in the play? A certain character is to present the ring from Olivia, and you know what happens there and so forth. All right, so put a little thought into that question. All right, now my next question, this is going to be good for you. I think you'll like this. The question reads, how are Sir Toby Maria uh, somewhat malicious in their dealings with Malvolio? You remember at a given time, I had already called your attention to the idea of practical jokes presented in the play. Some would say they might, you know, they may go a little bit beyond uh, just demonstrating practical jokes. Some say they may carry this a little bit too far. Talk about this whole business of how they plan to trick Malvolio. You know what Malvolio wants to do. He actually is presumptuous, presumptuous enough to think that he can win favor with Olivia. And you remember what they're going to, how they trick him and so forth. And notice at the end of the play what they do to him. So that's why I use the word, if you will, malicious. Uh, and then my last question, and you can take whatever number you want, because I said if you wanted to combine number one and two, you could do so. So my last question reads, what is the relationship between Antonio and Sebastian? And uh, talk about that. How did they come to meet each other and what goes on? So put a little bit of details here, if you will. Now, I want you to do this. You have enough time today. I'll post this short video uh, as soon as I finish here. And then you can look at it over the weekend. And as I said, maybe Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, uh, go ahead and give me an answer to these two sets of questions. I repeat, don't put that much into it in terms of a, you know, the formal Word document. You'll do that when you turn in your major exam. <clears throat> and let me get this by Monday morning, don't you think? 10 o'clock, I think, is, uh, gives you plenty of time. Now, with that in mind, what I want to do now, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this is one reason I cut my lecture a little bit, because I'm going to have you do something else. Part of what I'm doing is to let you, on your own, be a little bit creative as we prepare for the end of the semester. So I'm, in a purposeful way, I'm not going to go in and just analyze the play for you. I'm going to leave a little bit up to you. Now, what I would like for you to do, and you really have enough time, you can even start this over the weekend, and you're going to have all of next week to do it. And then this is going to be in preparation uh, for your final. I think... If you get nothing else, some of you may say, well, I need a little bit of help in uh, reading the play. And frankly, I'm being very reasonable here. I'm not going in, may I use the word in terms, or the theme in terms of our uh, play? I'm not being excessive with you in terms of your reading the play that carefully. I would like for you to be thoughtful, certainly, in reading the play. But I would like for you to do this. I want you to view a performance of Twelfth Night. I think this would be very good for you. And I don't really care that you view an entire performance of the play. Uh, go in and look at a little bit of the play and uh, see how the play, and you can go back, I mean, there are any number of productions. Go to YouTube, uh, 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 go, you know, 
uh, use the browser and uh, look up productions of the play. Uh, one that, you know, that I've used from time to time in class has been the BBC production of the play. Uh, there was the production of uh, Twelfth Night in the Globe Theater in uh, 2002, and the National Theater in uh, London did a production of the play. So uh, see if you can find a production of the play. This would also help you to read the play. Now, this play, in terms of its plot line, some might say just is a little bit more confusing uh, because of the disguise and a little bit of the manipulation that goes on. I don't find it that so, but <clears throat> some, and I guess it's legitimate. So what I'm going to have you do is on your own as you view a, uh, a production of the play, I want you to react to that production. <clears throat> and you're going to write for your final, which I'll say a little bit more in our last, uh, or in our next uh, lecture will probably come over the weekend or the early part of next week. And then I'm going to talk to you after I finish uh, my lecture about your uh, final, which will be your major exam, which will be due the following week. I want you to talk about how maybe a character uh, in the play is portrayed. Uh, you might want to, like I've done with you a little bit today, you might want to talk about uh, uh, how uh, certain themes uh, you recognize in the play. Uh, overall, I want you to be able to write, and you can start doing this now. Uh, simply start watching the play and then take some uh, mental written notes on the performance. Now, I'm assuming that you're going to go ahead and read the play. I'm not going to test you that readily. I'm not going to each period or each day I lecture give you questions. I've given you a few today, but I'm going to suspend this, and I would rather you spend a little bit of time trying to find a pro uh, production of the play. Simply, you're going to write me a, uh, a kind of little paper uh, summarizing what you found in terms of this production, uh, be it good or bad, what you liked, what you didn't particularly like, what, how you might suggest uh, in terms of an improvement, that sort of thing. Uh, for example, uh, you might watch a production in which they really go in for this idea of, you remember how I talked to you a little bit in As You Like It about uh, cross-dressing, uh, that sort of thing? Look in terms of Viola. Uh, uh, see, uh, in a particular production, how this may come across. Uh, there might be several ways of portraying a particular character in the play. I would think a good insight would be uh, watch a production and see how Malvolio uh, is presented. So this is what I want you to do. And I'll, and I'll tell you a little bit about how to write a kind of formal paper. You're going to turn it in as part of your final. But I thought I would give this to you today, this insight. So if you have the time, and you do, uh, see if you can't find a good production of the play and start watching it. And all that can do is enhance your ability to understand and to read the play. So as I said, I've been a little bit free with you today. I've, I'm a little bit more relaxed. One of the things that I I hope I can do, and I apologize a little bit for my appearance. Uh, I really need to get a haircut, and I'm looking forward to the day when I don't have to wear this cap, and I can get some of this trimmed. I'm a little bit afraid to ask some of my friends or to do it myself, but I guess in a sense they can't botch it up too much, So, um, but I'll still wait. Now seriously, have a good weekend. Um, I think it would be a good time, if you will, to sort of see the play. So uh, turn in these questions to me uh, by Monday, and you have a good weekend. And as I always say to you, be safe, keep well. Thank you. Bye.